Well, hello, everybody. Uh, today, we're going to be taking a look at uh, perhaps the closest time in world history that we ever came to ending all life on the planet. World War III and how it almost came about in the early 1960s with an event uh, that we've come to call the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we're going to be taking a look at that and how it very nearly came to World War III. Um, that it didn't and that we're all still here um, is, is testament to some of uh, some strange uh, instances of downright luck and ultimately some cooler heads that prevailed. Um, but it all has to kind of be understood um, in the framework of the Cold War. And uh, we'll take a step back and uh, give ourselves a sense of uh, some of the key players in this event um, as we look through a number of slides here. And do uh, take a break, you know, today and tomorrow as I give you guys this slideshow now. Don't try to watch everything all at once, kind of break it up into, you know, uh, bite-sized chunks so that you can think about what I'm talking about here and then kind of come back to it uh, and, and, and then watch some more of it later. Well, okay. Uh, Taking a look here at this guy, this bozo that you see right here, this guy's name is Nikita Khrushchev. Okay, Nikita Khrushchev. Now that Stalin has died, the Soviet Union, they had to figure out, well, who was going to replace him? Well, there was a bit of a power struggle in the early 50s trying to figure out who that person would be. You know, it's not a real easy thing to do in a uh, communist dictatorship because, you know, Stalin was always very wary of anybody who he thought had any kind of uh, aims towards, you know, becoming his successor and, you know, trying to, you know, keep uh, his uh, political rivals down meant that when he finally did die, um, it was a real challenge to try and figure out who would succeed him. How did he die? Well, um, there were some natural causes involved, but there was also the fact that Stalin's uh, doctors were frightened of uh, treating him, and they may have ultimately um, ended up, uh, you know, you know, causing his death by his their failure to treat uh, Stalin because they were terrified of him. In any event, um, now you've got Nikita Khrushchev, and he's going to be the new Soviet leader, and he is going to try and turn the page. He's going to try to say, you know, all the real depraved, nasty, evil things that Stalin did, how he was mistreating his own people, how he murdered so many of his own people and sent them off to, you know, gulags and death camps and all those terrible things. Khrushchev says, we're going to, we're going to make uh, the Soviet Union much nicer now. We're going to, we're going to kind of have a, kind of a, an easier go of communism, not so harsh. And we're going to try to work out some ways to focus on consumer goods in the Soviet Union and that kind of thing. And we're not going to be so harsh. Okay, well, that, that was what he said. And um, ultimately, he, he, he people in the West were hoping, you know, that, you know, he would turn out to be, you know, a new kind of, uh, of Soviet leader. Um, but the old ways in the Soviet Union, they, they kind of have a, a way of kind of bringing him back to the uh, centrally planned uh, Soviet style of really nasty, harsh uh, life. Uh, you can see him here. Uh, there was this time that he came to the United States. He was the first Soviet leader here now to come to the United States. And here he is in Iowa, and he's showing some kind of corn cob. And he, he you know, got to tour the United States. He, you know, made a stop at the United Nations building in New York. And then he really wanted to go out and see the American people. Uh, he really wanted to go to Disneyland. That was the thing that really, really bothered him. He couldn't go to Disneyland because they couldn't guarantee his security, so he was really bummed out about that. Uh, but he made a big show of himself in the United States, and people in the United States started thinking, you know, oh, maybe he is different. Maybe he's different. Who knows? Well, as we're going to see, this is the Soviet leader, Khrushchev, who's going to be the leader at the time that we came closest to World War III. How did that happen? Well, as you guys remember, we were very uh, much intent on containing the Soviet spread of communism. We didn't want communism to go beyond where it already was. And uh, Khrushchev was eager to spread communism. And um, 
one of the places that he was uh, kind of eager uh, to help out uh, was in Cuba. And uh, here's what's going on in Cuba. In the late 50s, there's going to be a new uh, revolution that takes place. Uh, the Cuban people for, you know, many, many years have, have kind of just thought of them, you know, themselves as kind of like neglected by the United States. And we were just like a, a big brother. And, you know, we, we kind of looked at Cuba as a place where, you know, Americans go to gamble and, and you know, have parties and things like that. And a lot of the people in Cuba were feeling kind of uh, poor and feeling kind of like just neglected. And so when Castro comes out and says, I will lead the Cuban people in a revolution and I will um, make Cuba into, you know, this uh, new communist country. Well, that really shocked Americans because that was like, wait, it's one thing to have communism on the other side of the world. But Cuba, Cuba, that's right next to Florida. See, here's Florida. How is that going to work? This is Castro. He's the revolutionary leader that takes over Cuba. And all of a sudden, with this communist country, and he starts um, you know, making waves by saying, hey, I'm a big communist country now. We support communism. Americans are getting very frightened. Like, why did that happen? How did Cuba become communist? Um, at the end of the Eisenhower uh, period, there's a number of Cubans who had left Cuba. They'd gone to Florida. Here they are. They got trained. They were going to become, you know, uh, fighters, and they were going to come back to Cuba and, and overthrow him, all right? Um, and by the time President Kennedy got elected, all these Cubans that had been, you know, had fled Cuba, who didn't like Castro, were getting ready. And they were going to go back to Cuba, and they were going to go and land boats there, and there was going to be some planes that flew overhead, and they were going to retake Cuba. Okay, so they had lost earlier Revolution Day to, to Castro, but now they said they're going to take it back. And they were going to land at this place here. You can kind of see it circled, uh, which on the map of Cuba is a little a bay. It's a bay, like with a beach and things like that, and it's called the Bay of Pigs. Okay, it has nothing to do with pigs. It's just what the name of the place is, the Bay of Pigs. So these guys were going to land, and they were going to have a counter-revolution. Okay, Cuba had already had a revolution and turned communist. Now, these guys had been trained in the United States, and they were going to come back and turn it away from communism. At least that was the plan. Okay, that was the plan. And JFK gave his approval. He said, okay, let's go ahead and do it. He said, uh, I've heard the CIA says this is going to work, and they'll remove Cuba and they'll turn it all back to normal. Well, that didn't happen. These Cuban exiles, they went back in, but they didn't get the kind of air cover, they didn't get the kind of support, and they were captured or killed, and it ended up making the United States look really, really ridiculous. You know, how is it that we couldn't, you know, support these uh, Cuban exiles and have them return to Cuba successfully? How, how could we not be successful? This is our own backyard, you know, Cuba. I mean, that's, that's right here. You know, this, is, this is Florida. How could we fail here? But we did. And when we failed, that meant uh, that Castro was still in there. But now he was very, very, very worried. He was pretty sure that we'd come at him again. He was certain that uh, the only way that he would have to make sure that the United States didn't try to, you know, come in with our Navy and our Army and, you know, the whole military, the United States military next time, was if he got some sort of additional support from the Soviet Union. So, Castro asks and Khrushchev provides a whole bunch of missiles, okay? These Russian missiles are going to come into Cuba. Khrushchev says, yeah, yeah, we'll put some missiles in there. We'll bring some missiles into Cuba. These are our Russian missiles, Soviet missiles, and they got nuclear warheads on them, okay? Yeah, we'll bring them in there. And then the, the Russians did. And they, they kind of secretly brought these missiles into Cuba. They brought them in boats, and then they started unpacking the boats, and they, they put them all up, and they got this crash course of, of missile deployment and things like that to get these missiles up and ready to go. And we wouldn't have known about this were it not for uh, we had some spy planes. 
and we had spy planes fly over and they take pictures and one of our spy planes flew over Cuba and we saw them taking these missiles out of the boats and assembling these missiles and putting these missiles together. And when they brought those uh, photographs back to um, you know the president and they said, look at Mr. President, obviously these are going to be um, nuclear tipped missiles that are right here in Cuba, very near the United States. And that's a huge threat to us because these missiles are within range. In other words, they can be fired from Cuba and they can reach almost any place. You can see in this big circle here, this is the range of long range missiles, about 2,000 miles. These are the range of maybe some shorter range missiles, 1,000 miles. Really what that means is any missile launched from Cuba with a nuclear tip on top of it uh, could reach within a matter of minutes, maybe five minutes warning before any of the cities in America could be nuked. Atomic bomb here, atomic bomb there, atomic bomb here, atomic bomb there, atomic bomb here, atomic bomb there, H-bomb, H-bomb. You know, all of these different cities within range, and you're looking at maybe 75 million people who could die within minutes, you know, of the launch of missiles from Cuba. And so that is a huge threat. And so when these pictures get developed, that the spy plane showed to JFK, he immediately knows that this is a really serious threat to the United States. And so JFK, JFK is the John Fitzgerald Kennedy, we just call him, you know, like FDR was uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but sometimes they go by initials. So JFK was very, very concerned about this. And he knew that something had to be done, okay? And the question that he needed to ask his army, his navy, the air force, he had to figure out what, what to do. Now the, you know, different generals would give him different pieces of advice. Um, the leader of the air force uh, would say, well, we should just go in there and bomb them. You know, just take our airplanes and go in there right now before they're completely assembled and you know put together and just bomb them. Just go in there and bomb them. And then send in the, the Marines afterwards and then invade Cuba and take over the country. Okay, you know, that was one option, you know, and then they said, and do it now. We don't have a lot of time to wait. Once these things become operational, we won't be able to do that, they said. You know, if, if these things are able to fire, then it's too late. So we got to do it now, now, now. So Kennedy's got a lot of pressure on him, but he, he doesn't want to do that just yet because he knows that if the United States does that and we take over Cuba and we bomb the heck out of this place, well, what are the Soviets going to do? Are they just going to go, hmm, all right, I guess that happened. No. Kennedy says, if we do that, the Soviet Union on the other side of the world, they're going to take over Berlin. Remember Berlin? Yeah. They'll just go right on in and take over Berlin. And they'll say, hey, you took over Cuba? We took over Berlin. Fair is fair. That's what they'll say. And then we'll say, no, you can't do that. And then we'll go back and forth and it will be... One thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, and pretty soon we're in World War III. And so Kennedy says, you know, come up with some other option. I, I, I got to find something else, what I can do. Like what? Uh, well, the Navy says, well, we've got another idea. What if we just made it so that any of these Soviet ships, okay, there's the Soviet Navy, what if we told them? We're not going to allow your ships, because we know what's on them. You've got more components. You've probably got nuclear weapons on them. You've probably got, you're bringing in the nukes over. What if we just told them that we're going to, they call it a quarantine, but it's a blockade. What if we just told them our ships are all around Cuba and we're not going to let any one ships come in. We're going to stop you. You know, anybody who comes in here, we're just going to stop those ships. We're going to say, no, we're boarding your ship. We're going to take a look and see what's on your ship and make sure that it's, uh, you know, nothing military, no components for a missile, no nuclear warheads, nothing like that. And we're going to search every single ship coming in. You know, if it's just food or something like that, fine, we'll let it through. But if it's anything else, we'll stop it. So that's what Kennedy goes with. He goes, okay, let's do that. Let's go ahead and put this blockade up around Cuba. 
Now, of course, the Soviets, they don't like that. They say that's just an act of war. Um, and for 13 days, okay, the 13 days they call this, um, the whole world is watching and finding out, are the Soviets going to try to make their way to Cuba? Will our ships stop them? Will our ships start shooting at each other? And if they do, then, you know, basically the whole World War III starts right there. Um, what will happen? So this, the whole world is watching while, while this unfolds. Um, in the meantime, the president is trying to uh, talk to the Soviets. You know, they don't have a really easy way to do it. They have to communicate um, sometimes through you know, diplomats and ambassadors. And it's a real hard thing to, you know, they didn't have the ability just to kind of get on the phone and like, have Kennedy call Khrushchev and talk to him and say, hey, you know, you should stop that and blah, blah. They, they couldn't do that back then. Um, they would learn that that's probably something they should be able to do after this whole thing um, ends. They realize, yeah, yeah, we really should have had open communications. That would have um, been a very good thing. But back and forth, there's some of these back channel, you know, talking to different uh, Soviet ambassadors and talking to different diplomats. It happens in D.C. It happens at the U.N. in New York. It happens on television. President Kennedy goes on television. He warns the Russians what's going to happen. So everybody, you know, in the whole world is knowing that this is going to be really, really big and really, really bad if we end up going uh, to full-scale, you know, assault and war and attacks and all that kind of stuff. This ends badly. And uh, we see the kind of this countdown clock. It's called DEFCON. It's defense conditions. And uh, my dad was actually up here in Minnesota, and he was getting the nukes armed onto airplanes that were going to be prepared to take off, um, you know, just outside of, uh, of in, it was in North Dakota. And these things were going to get ready to go. Um, it was just down to the last, you know, matter of minutes, you know, when they're trying to figure out, is this going to happen or not? Um, the, you will guys will find out that things came very close uh, to blowing up. There was a Soviet submarine, so it's underwater, and it's so far underwater that it can't really radio and listen to what's going on, and a United States ship dropped a, like a, a bomb under the water, and it blew up under the water, and the Soviet submarine thought, uh-oh, we're being attacked, and the Soviet submarine, at that point, could have launched its nuclear torpedoes. And that starts World War III. But in order for the Soviet submarine to launch a nuclear torpedo, uh, the captain of the sub, his first officer, and a political officer all have to agree. And two out of three of them agreed. But the one guy, you'll learn more about this on the little video clip that I'll, I'll share with you here later this week. One guy. One. Think about that. One guy on a Soviet submarine, he said... No, I don't think so. I don't think we should fire this nuclear torpedo. And so that one guy may have saved the world. It's amazing to think about that. So this was the closest we came to uh, really ending the world, okay? All life on Earth. If we had gone to World War III here, that would have been it, okay? That would have been it, okay? We see these guys sitting on these nukes. Khrushchev and Kennedy, they got their finger on the trigger, and they're kind of, you know, wrestling for the power, and they're kind of getting this. So you see the ships that are blockading, you know, each other. You got a U.S. ship saying, hey, where do you think you're going? We're going to pull you over. And that's going to be hard, too, because, you know, what if this uh, Russian ship doesn't stop? Well, then this guy has got commands. He's going to supposed to shoot out the rudder and, and force him to stop. Well, then what if this guy, you know, calls in a... Uh, a sub and shoots out this, and it's a, it's a real big mess. So we were really, really lucky uh, that things turned out the way they did. How did they turn out? Well, back and forth, the talking went behind the scenes, and eventually the United States and the Russians, when we realized how close we were getting, the United States told the Russians, you got to get the missiles out of Cuba, otherwise we invade. And the Russians goes, no, well, we're not doing that. And then we kind of came to an agreement. Uh, the president's uh, brother, Robert Kennedy, and he kind of worked out a deal uh, with the Soviet ambassador. He said, listen, how about this? We'll take our missiles out of Italy and Turkey in about six months. 
if you take out your missiles here in Cuba right now. And the Soviets knew that this was the only way that they would be able to, to kind of like get out of this. And we realized it was the only way that we could get out of this. So that's the agreement we came to. We basically agreed that, yeah, the Soviets would take these missiles, put them back on their boats and take them back. Um, and then we promised we wouldn't invade Cuba. And we haven't ever since, although we still have a little place called Guantanamo Bay. It's a naval base on Cuba, but that's uh, that was there before this. But now, ever since, Cuba has been, you know, it, its own communist country, and that is still that way even today. Okay, so those missiles are gone, but uh, we also had to take out our missiles that were kind of obsolete out of uh, Turkey and Italy, and that's kind of how we agreed to not bomb each other, okay? So this is where the, the Ukes and the Zooks, standing there in the wall, decided to walk away and save the world.